Hey, what's up, PTSD buddies? Wouldn't be me if we were uh, on time. We are a little bit late again, and yeah, it's always just my fault because I got nothing but the best of gear. But we're gonna have a little PTSD buddy chat with my friend Amanda. And Amanda's somebody I know because Amanda's a newbie just like me, and she's been to some uh, some of our meetings here in St. John's. How you doing, Amanda? I'm not bad. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. I can, oh, I can barely hear you that time. You sounded good first when I was talking to you before I turned on the camera. Now I can barely hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, <laughs> I can hear you now. <laughs> yeah. So Amanda, let's have a PTSD chat. Amanda, when I, I know you have PTSD, we've talked before, and yeah. I know I know your story, but our members don't know your story. So how about we start with giving the members a little bit of background on who you are? Okay, um, well, my name is Amanda, I'm 27 years old. Um, I was diagnosed with PTSD in last year. I've been longer than that, most people can probably relate to. Um, a lot of shit usually goes down before you need to get a diagnosis. Um, mine stems from other people abuse and um, some emotional neglect. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I went through it, I have to tell you that I'm years old. Um, no, I'm having a hard time hearing you again, Amanda. I'm going to have to go ahead and step me out so you can hear me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the last part you heard? What's that? What's the last part that you heard? Um, I'm looking here now. <laughs> the last part I heard was going to the patio. <laughs> <laughs> you yell at me. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll go back. To, um, the childhood sexual abuse started when I was about four years old. Four um, years old. <laughs> four, yeah. Um, it went down until I was about ten, and there were at least two different people. Right. And um, I recently started uh, the trauma program that's off by a health uh, here, so I've been doing a lot of things, and I realized, you know when you read about it in like books and stuff where they say, you know, like, um, the child is most vulnerable? The child is most vulnerable, yeah. I was that child. Yeah. And I realized there were a lot of other people that were around me that could have easily been a victim as well, but um, I was um, Sorry, I, I lost you again. You're cutting in and out. I, I can, hear, I can hear you. You're just cutting in and out that time. There was some emotional neglect um, on my parents' behalf. So I grew up in a household where there was a lot of fear, not a whole lot of respect right. or love for that matter. Right. So, um, yeah, I can kind of see how I was set up for that. Well, you know. I've said it before that uh, the number one cause of PTSD is abuse, but the real number one cause is child abuse, if you want to pinpoint it. So you're not alone <laughs> with PTSD and child abuse. It took me a long time to accept that uh, a lot of the choices and a lot of my behaviors are learned behaviors. Um, they definitely stem back to things that I've experienced and then I've learned to attack. So. Yeah. Well, you, you've been dealing with it for a long time. I mean, since you were four years old. What got you through it? Yeah. A lot of negative coping behaviors for a long time. Yeah. Um, I um, used to disassociate a lot uh, when it was happening. And uh, I repressed a lot for a very long time. Um, when I was 12 years old, I started to experience symptoms of depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation. Right. And I didn't have an outlet or a safe place. I didn't have a person, a protector of sorts. Yeah. Um, parents weren't people to go to. Actually, my mother found out about it when I was 12, found out about the sexual abuse, and uh, encouraged me to be quiet. And uh, <laughs> Encouraged yeah. you to be quiet. Now... I can't, I, imagine, I can't imagine what you were thinking at that point. 
I was really scared, and I, you know, if your own mother doesn't defend you, who's going to? Well, as a child, you look to your mom or your dad for protection, for for love. And by the sounds of it, you found none of that with them. No, and um, like I said, a lot of that come to conclude during talking to a lot of uh, counselors and stuff that a lot of the self harm and self abuse behavior that I've adapted over the years have stemmed from not having the compassion or support. First. Yeah. Yeah, Kira mm-hmm. says uh, this, this, I'm sorry, <laughs> as soon as I started reading it, went up. Dissociation happens a lot with childhood trauma. I'm so sorry to hear she told you not to, not uh, and not defended you. Jeez, that was really hard for me to get in there, Tom. I'm so sorry, Kira. <laughs> uh, Kira also said that mine also did the same. Sorry you had to hide it. Uh, yeah, I can't imagine um, being that like that young of an age, Amanda, and having to go through that for one. But when you finally get the courage to tell someone, because I'm sure it took a lot of courage just to tell your mother it happened. Well, right? it was more of a passive, um, more of a passive outcry, I guess, because uh, through I started writing uh, a lot for, uh, for when I started experiencing depression, right. and uh, my mother actually had found something that I had written, and it. Uh, contained some, you know, there was a lot of graphic explanation of sexual abuse, of suicidal ideation, it had talked about self-harm behaviors, it had talked about bullying that I was experiencing at the time, and um, she told me not to bring it to school, Um, if a teacher seen it, I would get in trouble, and how would that look on her? How would it look on her? Yeah, there was a lot of anger towards my mother, so I'm a teeny. I guess you did, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I've at my mother also experienced uh, abuse. Sorry, say that uh, again. My mother also experienced sexual abuse. Really? And oh, so- the way that she dealt with it was by putting up and shutting up, by not dealing with it. Um, her mother died when she was 12 years old. So she didn't have the resources herself either. But yeah. instead of turning around and trying to do for me what she didn't have for her, she could just ask abuse, I would, basically. I would think that like when someone goes through something like that, the last thing they would want is, you know, their daughter, or son, whatever child to go through it. And she told you to hide it. I mean she, I figured she, I'm sorry, I just figured she would relate and want to really help you on this. That would, that's just my thought. Yeah, that's what I would expect, but it's not what happened. Yeah. Um, uh, here sir, uh, says, I can relate so much to you, Amanda. You were so brave to come out and tell you and to tell, uh, your story and not suppress all of this. Thank you. I did suppress it for a very long time, and it nearly destroyed me. So now yeah. I'm trying to be as open as I can be because that's how I deal with it. Yeah, it's, it's not easy. Like I was saying earlier, it's not easy to share your story. And I know it wasn't easy for you to tell your mother that you were abused like that. So to one, come up with the courage, I can't imagine. I, I just can't imagine because I, I know when I was a kid, I looked at my parents, I was like, God, it's like they were my, I, could, I knew I could always go to my parents. As a matter of fact, I, we were talking earlier about my new book. I dedicated this book to my mom and dad. Right at the very beginning, there's even a picture of them. Oh, that's awesome. Because I'm proud to say I had a great childhood. My parents were amazing, supportive. So it really, you're not the first person I've talked to, Amanda, who had a rough childhood and a I can't imagine going through that as a child. Like, my heart really goes out to you, man. I'm sorry. Yeah, you learn to deal with it. Not always in the best way, but you deal. Yeah. Well, man, what kind of symptoms have, uh, has, has surfaced from your PTSD? Like, I know me, I, I used to deal a lot with nightmares, and I, I don't, not so much anymore. But uh, crowds still get to me. 
you know, public crowds and stuff. Do you have any kind of symptoms? Um, my symptoms kind of, like I said, I repressed a lot for a very long time. And uh, actually, first after the abuse had started, I had started exhibiting uh, compulsive and anxiety behaviors. Sorry, I would compulsive and anxiety behaviors. Okay. So I would be uh, excessively washing my hand. I would continuously pick my lip until there was absolutely no skin on my lip for a long time. And uh, the weird thing is, is that I was not a child who acted like very people because this stuff happening out of the blue. Yeah. Um, once I started to, well, I would say unravel in high school after um, my mother had found out and had, you know, encouraged me to be quiet, I um, started self-harming. Yeah. I would cough. I soon became hypersexual, seeking attention. Um, and then I started using drugs. I think I was probably 13 the first time I ever had gotten drunk. Um, probably the first time I ever smoked pot was 13. It was just, I would do anything and everything that I could do to try to make the pain go away. Yeah. And it just eventually got worse as I got older. Uh, well, I'm actually a as well. Sorry, um, I, I lost you after next year. Uh, so I'm actually a um, recovering addict as well. So oh, right. um, that was a direct symptom of my trauma. So. Yeah. So who's so, who's it, who's in your life now, man? That's helping you through this. I'm surrounded by a lot of counselors. Um, I screwed up really bad and I committed a crime. So I'm actually involved. Uh, with mental health court services right now. Um, they have some really, really, really great people on their staff, and unfortunately, you basically have to pull story your life in order to get the state. Um, I'm involved in a concurrent disorders program that deals with uh, mental health and addictions, and I'm involved in a trauma group that deals specifically with uh, childhood abuse. Yeah. My family is as supportive as they can be, but there's some disconnect there, obviously. And I do have friends that I can turn to. But the thing that I've really learned is that I learned what different people can't ask me, what my reinsurance can give me. Sorry, so people not, can't. Certain people can provide different types of reassurance, different types of support. Yeah. And I've had to learn who can provide what. So I'm not disappointed. Like, I wouldn't call my mom after a rough trauma counseling session and seek support. Yeah. That would be setting up for failure. <laughs> so. See, that sounds like you, that sounds like the words of someone who's been dealing with PTSD for a long time. You sound yeah. like you, you can plan your day around your PTSD a little. What, now that right? I've dragged myself out of the deep hole of addiction and depression, and that I have some stability in my life, that um, being proactive is really trying to control my life. I um, go to the gym on a regular basis. I try to eat nutritious food uh, so it makes me feel better. Yep. I attain all my counseling appointments. Um, I'm on medication for nightmares because for a while I was having flashbacks while I was awake and I had nightmares as well. So it was helpful for it. Yeah, that would probably good. That would take away a lot of sleep for you. And then uh, I guess with no sleep, you kind of get a little irritable. Yeah, just just a little bit. Yeah, it's <laughs> funny how it all pieces together, right? Yeah, hungry, hungry, angry, lonely, and tired are definitely triggers for me. <laughs> so I need to <laughs> sure. sure that if I'm going for a period of time where I'm not going to be home for lunch, that I have a snack with me or um, make sure that. You know, I'm going to bed at a reasonable time so I can get at least seven hours sleep. So, yeah, it's, it, there's a lot of planning. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, 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 I know all about it. I know all about it. Um, Kira, Kira said self mutilation was an escape as well for her. Uh, 
She said she has she has other unsafe and coping skills, but she she asks, what do you do now to help you cope? Well, I guess that you you kind of answered that beforehand. You were talking about these little groups and everything that you're involved with. Do you find these groups help you? I do. Um, but I find that I have my uh, structured um, appointments with my social workers and counselors and stuff, but I have community support groups as well. PTSD buddies, narcotics and um, our channel we have here, so I seek out all kinds of different supports. That's good, yeah. Yeah, and um, I don't know if you probably heard of it, the Sandy Rule for dealing with impulsive behavior. No, I don't think I know that one. I can't remember exactly what it stands for. I used to have it, but I don't have it right now. But in I had become very impulsive, or had become very impulsive in my folks. So mm -hmm. I would, um, I would eat, I would spend money, I would do drugs, I would engage in risky sexual behaviors, I would like, speed, like anything that was seeking out a sensation, basically. Yeah. So uh, in my recovery, I've learned to try to control my impulse, but, and uh, what you have to do is you be able to recognize it, find the situation, remove yourself from the situation immediately, consider the consequences, and just don't do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like wise words. Words. Jeez, I'm having a hard time talking today. Oh my gosh. Um, what about panic attacks? Panic attacks have become a big part of my life. I still remember my first one. Do you remember your first panic attack? There's been so many. I can't. I can't even remember. No? I no, don't. but I... My, my first one always stands. What's that? What was your first one like? It was in a grocery store. And I've since, since I've told people that, I've found so many other people, and the first a panic attack was in a grocery store. I don't know what it is about a grocery store, but I passed out. I uh, I had a cart full of groceries. I moved up to the front of the, where the checkout was. And I guess with all the people there, I just started panicking. My heart started beating really fast, and I couldn't breathe. I passed out. I don't know how long I was out, but I passed out. And I thought I was having a heart attack. I don't even... At the time, I didn't even know what a panic attack was. Never heard of it. Yeah. Right? It was really scary, too. Yeah, I mean, you panic because of panic. Hey, <laughs> I find... I, I, um, I'm a big, tough army guy, so I don't ask for help or nothing, right? Like, yeah, it was at, it's now, I, uh, when I talk about that, talk about that moment, I realized, like, you ever hear a story where people are choking, and a lot of people end up choking because they're too embarrassed to tell anybody that they're choking, so they go to the bathroom and try to get it themselves? I totally get yeah. that, because even though I passed out and I was okay and I stood up, I was so embarrassed. My first thought was, like, oh, my God, who's seen me? lying on the honeycomb cereal right because <laughs> that's what i was doing i was lying on the honeycomb <laughs> cereal i do it's not picture you in about <laughs> yeah yeah I don't. Honeycombs. yes it's funny <laughs> yeah that's me yeah yeah but i passed it in honeycomb yeah but i uh you know i was so embarrassed i just ran out of there but why do you say that's a really good metaphor actually for ptsd because I was talking to uh, talking about it to one of my counselors the other day. Yeah. I had a trouble trying to obtain services and for someone to actually pay attention to me because I knew there was something wrong with me. Obviously, the things that I was doing, I'm, I'm not a stupid person. I know what I was doing wasn't right, but it was almost like what I needed to do at the time. But um, I had gone to different doctors. I had been seeing a psychiatrist, and it was almost like nobody was taking me seriously. And yeah. it's like, when you feel like you're a piece of shit, and you genuinely believe it with every piece of yourself that you are worthless, to try to avail of services is one of the most hard things that I've ever... Well, it's so hard to explain a man. But if a guy has depression, or a girl has depression, and they go to the hospital, and they go, and the doctor's first going to say, what's wrong? Well, I'm sad. Why are you sad? Well, I don't, I don't really know why I'm sad. I'm just sad. 
Well, if you don't know why you're saying well, then how are we supposed to know why you're saying There's got to be a reason why you're saying There must be a reason. What's the reason? What's the reason, Manda? <laughs> yeah. well, I, I don't think there has to be a reason. You're just saying. I'm a registered nurse, and I've seen both sides of the healthcare system, and I it scares me. You're, you're a registered nurse? Yes. Well, God I should say I love was you. Before, right now, I was before Amen. I fucked up my life. <laughs> God love you, because I know a few nurses, and for what you people go through, my God. And when you get into the hospital, do, do they actually let you go home? Because I've seen nurses that don't ever go home, I swear to God. They don't let them go home. Her, you know... I was, I like to think that I was one of the ones who cared because I, I was a patient as well as a nurse, so I kind of, mm -hmm. I had more questions, but I have been in situations where people have used more mental health issues against me, other staff members. Um, I've been in situations where I've seen other people with PTSD, with patients, um, be judged and be treated differently because of their diagnoses. Oh, sure. So it, very, very uncomfortable place to be when you're being told, well, my parents told me I couldn't be the way that I was, my doctors told me I couldn't be the way that I was, my coworkers told me that I couldn't be the way that I, way that I am. And it's just like, there's a complete identity for this <laughs> Yeah, just stop it. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay, Amanda, it'll be okay, just stop it. Stop what you're doing. Yeah. Well, just, see, just don't be PTSD is so hard to explain to somebody because you're not really sure what it is anyway, right? And you try to explain it to a person and it's impossible, right? I mean, you can explain a broken limb, broken bone, but to explain your feelings to somebody, it's hard, right? Yeah. And, but when you talk to somebody else who's going through it, you, it's like you don't even have to say anything. You just kind of look at me and go, yeah. Yeah, man, you go ahead and be sad. Tomorrow will be a better day. Right? Hopefully. When I was in... Yeah, really, hopefully. When I was in full-blown addiction and I lost my job, I uh, was very ashamed. Um, I wouldn't go out. I, I had just... I knew in what schedule that I worked, and I would go get groceries in the night time on days that I knew that the coworkers that I worked with would be working. So I wouldn't think about it. I did everything in my power to be invisible. Yeah. Heather actually was just going, I was just asking, uh, were you open with your coworkers about uh, having PTSD? No. No? Definitely not. Um, I was open about having depression. Um, so I actually have bipolar depression, but you don't speak the term bipolar because in every picture a mental case. Yeah. So, I mean, I personally obviously don't feel that way, but it's there's a huge stigma and um, against well, a lot different of people are trying to lose jobs, to lose space at certain places, right? I mean, I know guys and girls who've been kicked out of the military because they have PTSD. I had untreated PTSD that involved into a full-blown addiction that led me to committing the crime, which led to me losing my job. Really, huh? There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's like, in my it was too bad, so sad, so try not to kill yourself. <laughs> yeah. Could I ask what the crime was? I stole narcotics from work. Yeah. I'm very ashamed <clears throat> of it. Um, I'm facing up to the consequences of my actions. I mean, I've never denied that I've done it. Yeah. I was obviously in a very desperate situation. The first time that I took narcotics from work was a suicide attempt. I was really? on so much other medication at the time. Um, my doctor had me maxed out on antidepressants, had me maxed out on Ritalin and Valium for night night. And uh, I thought that by adding morphine to the cocktail that it would look like a overdose. Yeah. I didn't buy, so I continued to take more and more, and I would stack doses up on doses until I would take my cash. After a while, it didn't take very long that my body required painkillers to not throw up as soon as I woke up, basically. So it was, um, 
it was a huge cry for help when um worked out. It was the last part no. of last year. It was, I got as far as a huge cry for help. It was a huge cry for help, but unfortunately, it went unnoticed for about two years. Two years, yeah. Holy shit. Amanda, my God, Amanda, you've, uh, you've, you've gone through so much. And you're still sitting there with a smile on your face. <clears throat> Amanda, that's, what? That's what everybody's... What? what? Uh, if, if, if there was one thing that's keeping that smile on your face, what is it? Depends. It depends? Depends. Well, it's a depends. defense mechanism. Oh, is it? Yeah. You know what? I do the same thing. I crack jokes and stuff and everything. I and, do too. And everyone's like, oh, she's so happy and so yeah, fun yeah, here. Yeah, and yeah. it's just like, <laughs> yeah. you have no freaking idea. Yeah. How about this? You go somewhere and you're like, oh, all you hear is, oh, a man is here. Now the party can begin. The man is here. And you gotta, and you're like this, but you gotta be yeah. the Amanda that everybody wants to fucking be, right? Well, <laughs> since I've, you know, I'll say this side of recovery, since I've been like actually stable, um, I'm really honest with people, and sometimes people tell me I'm too honest, but you know what? I don't really care about what other people think anymore. Um, oh. If I'm having a bad day and someone says, how are you? I'll be like, not really that great while, like, how are you? <laughs> and yeah, someone will just stop and look at me and be like, do you actually want me to tell you about my day, or are you just asking, and they'll, like... Are you just going through the motions? Um, yeah. Amanda, we're out of time. Damn it. <laughs> Can you believe it's been uh, 30 minutes? I can't believe That's it. That's crazy. This is the first time I looked at the time, and time is not. Amanda, I got, one, I got one question before we go, though. What's that? Uh, I always like to end with this one question. Amanda, have you had a message or a tip or anything that you could say to somebody out there right now who's listening who's struggling with PTSD? What would it be? My message would probably be that no matter how dark of a place you're in, no matter how little or insignificant or poisonous that you feel you are worth more than you think and at some point you will see that but you need to find something to hold on to Amanda thanks so much for having the chat with me tonight. no problem thanks for having me oh it was, it was so much fun I mean I, I always get a laugh at you when you're at the meetings so uh, <laughs> forward to having a chat with you tonight. Do you know about Sundays? Right. Sunday we're going to walk. <laughs> I'm working Sunday. I know. You don't stop, Amanda. You don't stop. But Amanda, thanks so much for having a chat with me. I hope we can have a chat again. Yes, I hope so. Good night, buddies. We, I feel we got a lot more to talk about. But uh, thanks so much, Amanda. And we'll talk again soon. Or we'll see each other again soon, I, I'm hoping. Right? Sounds good to me. All right, cheers.